my pranams to all of you. I hope uh, you're all feeling energetic, enthusiastic. You know, national education policy is uh, a document that needs to be read carefully to understand what implications it has to the educational system of our country. But um, considering the time constraints that we have, I will touch upon few aspects of the national education policy and how we can implement them in our educational institutes. You know, the other day I was telling um, in another lecture a small story. Lord Rama, when he was living in the forest, one day he got very restless. Suddenly a question popped up in his mind and he could not find the answer. So he went to his guru Vashisht. He knocked on the door and Vashisht was inside and he was preparing to sleep because it was late night. In an irritating voice, he said, Who are you? Then Sri Rama replied, Swamiji, I came here to find an answer to this very question. Who am I? No, as an individual, as a country, it is very, very important that we know who we are. That's the first step. Now, one day after my class was over at IIT Delhi, I was walking towards my office and one student met me. Among several questions, he asked a very interesting question. He said, sir, tell me one thing that I should never do in my life. Then I told him, you know, we normally commit two mistakes. One of the mistakes is not recognizing our own inner potential. The other important mistake that we commit is, even if you have known your inner potential, you don't function to the fullest of your potential. These are the two things that we should never commit, these two mistakes. And the national education policy aims at removing these two fallacies of our educational system. It aims at learning about ourselves, about our country, and then working to the fullest of our potential so that we will become a world leader, a technological leader in the world. I will uh, pick up uh, a couple of aspects of the national education policy. You know, all of you know that the five foundations on which the national education policy is built is uh, uh, access, equity, quality, affordability, and accountability. And of course, there are many other key points in the national education policy, such as pr uh, providing multidisciplinary holistic education, removing the boundaries between the disciplines, introducing digital technology in our education, you know, you also heard about academic bank of credits, multi-exit, multi-entry education, providing vocational training right from the beginning uh, to the students, internationalization of our education, you know, increasing the GER to 50% uh, and so on. There are several key aspects. I would like to take up the issue of equity. How? Our lack of attention to equity actually killed our educational system. I understand that there are many teachers in this audience and there are many students also in this audience. So I would like to share some of my thoughts as your colleague. Equity. You know, there is a small story about three kids going to a zoo and they were looking at different animals and they came to the tiger enclosure and the tiger was there somewhere, and around the enclosure there was a small wall, um, and these three kids, they wanted to see the tiger. One of them is taller than the wall, and the other kid is just about the height of the wall, 
And the third key is, kid is very short. The for taller uh, uh, kid, there was no problem. And the kid which is just about the height of the wall, we're just trying to see into the, with difficulty, she, uh, the, the kid could see the tip of the tiger. The zookeeper, he looked at their struggle and he brought a table and he laid the table there, something like this, and asked all the three kids to stand on that. For the taller kid, it was of no use at all. And for the kid which is about the height of the wall, that kid could see very easily the tiger. But the shorter kid, still falling short of the wall. So all along, what we did in our educational system was provide an education thinking that it fits all. But today, in national education policy, we are looking at child-centric, student-centric education. It is important for, for us to recognize as teachers that students have unique capabilities. And it is for us to tap those unique capabilities and make them productive instead of just providing one fits all solution to all these students. You know, national education policy has many, many good things. There have been a lot of uh, discussions across the country. But when it comes to implementing in our own institutions, it is very important that we communicate with our teachers and students effectively and tell them how it will transform their own lives if the national education policy is implemented. All of you have used a mouse trap, right? Have you used a mouse trap? You have used it. And you will be surprised to know that the idea of this mouse trap was invented in 18th century. And since then, more than 50,000 patents have been filed in US alone. But none of us use those good mouse traps. We still use this old mouse trap. You know, if anybody thinks that their idea is very good and people will simply fall and adopt those ideas, that is called mouse trap myth. And we need to break this mouse trap myth. We need to educate, we need to debate and discuss about the good qualities of the national education policy and the responsibility lies on all of us. Now, let me look at um, uh, you know, a very small uh, uh, story. This is a 18th century Persian parable. Now, two people, well, one person was walking in the forest for, for several days and he could not find any way out. He was really frustrated. And um, on third day or fourth day, he saw another person at a distance. He was also walking towards him. And when both of them met, the first person says, no, I was wandering around this forest. I could not find a path. But in any case, don't follow the path that I followed because it will not take you anywhere. The second person says, the same is true with me. I was also wandering around this forest and I could not find a path and don't follow the path that I was following. And then both of them, they decide, come join hands. Let us find our new way. And that is how we need to do, because you all know that education is in the concurrent list. Both the state governments and also the central government have to work hand in hand together. And I'm so glad to listen uh, from the speakers in the morning that Karnataka state has taken proactive steps to implement the national education policy. And that is very, very important. And I'm sure when states such as Karnataka state implement the national education policy, the rest of the country and the other states also will follow in line because they don't uh, want to fall behind. Now, let me look at, um, I spoke about uh, equity and why it is important. Let me also um, tell you a couple of things about how this multidisciplinary education will transform our educational landscape in the country. Let us uh, identify one activity at which you are good. Can you raise anybody your hand who doesn't know cycling in this hall? I'm sure nobody will raise, right? And imagine how did you arrive at the proficiency level that you have today at cycling? If you recollect, I'm sure 
each one of us must have fallen down at least a couple of times while learning our cycling. I'm sure some of our friends might have come and given the feedback, what to do, what not to do while cycling. And that's how we reached to the proficiency level that we had. National education policy precisely aims at doing this, that you learn by doing things, not just by listening uh, to lectures, not by mugging up uh, things. So how do we introduce, as teachers in our regular classroom teaching, how do we introduce activities which will enhance the learning of the students? That is one of the primary objectives of the national education policy. You know, as teachers, I always believed that my role is not to teach. As a teacher, my role is to make my students the best learners. That is my role. But then that brings us uh, to the question of what exactly is learning? Sir, could you please explain what is learning in one or two words? Can you tell me what is learning? Right. What is learning? Well, if you look at the definition of the cognitive science, cognitive science very clearly says learning means collection of information first through our five senses, encoding this information and putting this in our long-term memory and retrieving this information once in a while and using it. That is what is learning. Are we doing enough in our regular class classroom teaching to emphasize on all these things? By the way, it is not just only the modern cognitive science. Long, long ago, Adi Shankara said, if you want to become a good learner, there are four things that you need to do. Patanam, Mananam, Chintanam, Sankirtanam. Patanam, you have to study. Mananam, you have to remember. Chintanam, you have to critically think. Sankirtanam, you have to repeat the whole process. Can you please, can you please repeat what did Adi Shankara say? Patanam, Mananam, Chintanam, Sankirtanam. Please tell your students, these are the four things that the students have to do. And that is what the national education policy aims at. But if I become a good learner, what is the use? What is the next step? What is that we need to encourage our students to be? The next step is our students should be encouraged to be creative. And what is creativity? Sir, what is creativity? Creativity means generating new ideas. And the playground is our mind. That is where new ideas are generated. And modern science very clearly tells us that new ideas are generated when unlike minds meet. When unlike people sit and debate and discuss, new ideas are generated. When unlike disciplines meet each other, new ideas are generated. You know, and also the ecosystem in which these unlike minds meet. That is also important if we want to encourage our students to become creative. You know, in 1990s, one psychologist, he wanted to find out how creative ideas are generated in the minds of the scientists. So what he did, he picked up four molecular biology labs across the world, top molecular biology labs, and he set up video cameras. And for years, he observed the scientists working inside these labs. When you think of a molecular biology scientist, what image comes in your mind? A scientist in a white gown um, with the protective goggles, sitting in front of the microphone and watching uh, at those microbes for hours and hours, and then suddenly, Eureka, I have an idea. But to your surprise, this psychologist, after years of study, he found that it never happened like that. Creative ideas are generated in informal setups. After your long hours of work, when you meet with each other or a cup of tea, or when you bumped with each other in the corridors, when ideas flew from one project to the other project, that is when new ideas are generated. That is the importance of um, bringing, creating an ecosystem where students debate and discuss and question what they know 
in order to generate new ideas. I don't know how many of you know um, that when uh, Mendeleev, when he designed the periodic table of elements, do you know about it? In December 2019, there is an article in Scientific American. And this article says that Mendeleev perhaps might have been influenced by the Sanskrit Akshara Mala while designing the periodic table. And how did this happen? In those times, um, in St. Petersburg University, there was a department of oriental languages. And there was a professor of Sanskrit in that uh, department. And Mendeleev and this professor of Sanskrit, they used to meet uh, during lunch hour and ideas used to flow between them. And that is how Mendeleev people say that he got the idea of designing this periodic table of elements from the Sanskrit Akshara Mala. In fact, some of the elements which were not known in the periodic table at that time, he used Sanskrit uh, to identify those empty boxes, ekam, vayam, trayam. That is the importance of the multidisciplinary approach that we are trying to introduce in the national education policy. I would like to tell one more example. You know, when we are doing this space exploration, it is unlimited. But unfortunately, inside the rocket, inside the satellite, the space is limited. And one of the important components of any satellite is um, the solar panel. How do you fold it and put it inside that small satellite? That was a challenge faced by NASA scientists. And then they called an expert of origami uh, art. You know origami is the art of folding paper. So this artist came and taught the NASA scientists how to fold um, the solar panels so that they become compact and they can be taken to the space. This is how multidisciplinary education will help us. You know, in late 19th century, um, many kids were dying within few weeks of their birth. Even today, out of about 130 million students who are born every year, nearly four, la four million kids, they die within the four weeks of their birth. And um, a, sign a doctor, a specialist, uh, a child specialist who was working in uh, a Paris hospital in 1870s, he was very much worried about it. And um, one day he wanted to take a break. Um, he went to a nearby zoo and he saw in one of the places there in the zoo that this um, hen, uh, uh, the, the uh, chicken uh, in, in uh, the, uh, what do you call the, the chicken, small chicken, they were in an enclosure and they were happily moving around. And uh, when he inquired with the zookeeper, the zookeeper said, well, it has a controlled temperature inside this uh, enclosure. And that is why these chickens are very, very healthy there. And this doctor got an idea. Why not I build a similar kind of thing and take it to my hospital? And lo, when he designed this and implemented it in his hospital, the child death rate came down significantly. And you see, he did not get this idea um, in working in a lab. It, it, this idea has, came, uh, has come through a kind of you know, out-of-the-box thinking. Today, incubators cost about 40,000 US dollars. And uh, through various international programs, we send these incubators to many countries. And unfortunately, these incubators are so complex that they fail within few years and there is no local expertise to repair these incubators. And this is where I want to tell you learning creativity to how we can jump to innovation. So let me give you one example of how we move from creativity to innovation and how we should encourage our students in this. So an MIT professor, he found that, why is that um, these incubators which are supplied to these countries, they are failing and they are becoming unusable after a few years. Can we find an alternative to this? So when he visited the rural areas of these countries, he found that the automobiles were running very well there. The tractors, the two-wheelers, the lorries, and so on. 
then an idea came to him why not i build um an an incubator using the local automobile parts that are available that is what is innovation innovation is providing value to your ideas so he built a local incubator using the headlight of a lorry for providing warmth using the dashboard fan of a vehicle uh, to for air circulation and then a battery of a tractor to power up this incubator and if something went wrong the local automobile expert was there and he could repair this and this is what is innovation and as teachers it is our responsibility that we encourage the students to become good learners creative thinkers and also innovators let me just check um, the time i have so i will just take uh, uh, two minutes it's already 1:18 from the schedule i know that we had to close at uh, 1:15 um one last thing i would like to tell you this is about the language the emphasis on language in national education policy i am a very strong supporter of providing education to our kids in our local languages in our mother tongue if you look at the 10 countries in the world which have received the largest number of nobel prizes you will see that in each of those countries the children study in their mother tongue right from the school level to the phd level mahatma gandhi said <laughs> mahatma gandhi was a very strong supporter of providing education in our indian languages he said by teaching them in an alien language in english we are turning our own kids aliens in our country he said by next year let us implement the language the indian language based education don't worry about the textbooks don't worry about anything let us implement that was the passion uh, that mahatma gandhi had of course aict has already approved about 10 colleges they have given permission to start the professional uh, courses engineering courses in local languages but however there are some people they have some valid questions how can we provide professional education in local languages for example in kannada or in telugu by the way i studied in telugu until plus 2 and um, uh, uh, it never prevented me uh, from doing the kind of research that i am doing so some of the questions that people are raising are what happens if these students have to go to the masters de uh, uh, degree how can uh, a kannada trained student go and study english medium masters degree um and what about the availability of the books you know most of the undergraduate st students right um barring 10 or 12 percent most of them they are employed in their local places imagine in an automobile industry located in karnataka if the engineer understands only in english and speaks only in english the workers are all thinking in kannada and they speak in kannada it will not go well but i suppose i also think in kannada and i also study in kannada and i interact with my workers who are also uh, kannada uh, speaking people i can communicate very well point 1 when we translate our books we should not be purists that for every word let us find out our kannada equivalent or telugu equivalent from electrical engineering let me give you an example if there is a resistor you call it resistor if there is an inductor you call it an inductor so when you do that if i am studying in kannada because national education policy also emphasizes that do not neglect english english must be taught as a communication tool if you want to connect with the rest of the globe today the reality is you need to be proficient in english so with a greater emphasis on learning english as a tool of communication and by thinking in my own language kannada language or telugu language by uh, research has shown very clearly that if you are taught in your mother tongue tongue you become much more creative rather than studying in uh, some other language you know suppose i give you a cycle and uh, uh, 
and you don't know cycling, assume I give you a cycle and then I ask you to go to a city uh, and find out some place there. Now you have to do two, two things here. How to manage my cycle because I don't know learning or uh, cycling. And then I have to focus on how to navigate through the city to reach my destination. The same thing is happening to the kids. When you are teaching me the concepts, when you are teaching me about the nature, I also have to focus on learning English. So that's defeating the very purpose of the education. So therefore, um, it is important that as teachers, we should engage ourselves in translating some of the best books that are available in English in, in our language without being uh, purists. And there is also a lot of business um, that can happen to the publishers. Assume a, a four-year B.Tech degree in eight semesters, um, they do something like 35 courses. And in each course, there are two textbooks that teachers suggest. There are 70 books. And if these 70 books can be converted into Kannada, and if there are seven other states which also convert, uh, uh, 10 other states which also convert into their respective uh, languages, you have 700 textbooks that need to be printed in local languages. And there's a huge business for the uh, publishing houses. I'm sure they will be very happy to come and print um, uh, these kind of books. So the point I'm trying to make here is that, yes, national education policy is there. This central government and state governments are doing many things. But as universities, as teachers, are we taking the first step to implement many aspects of the national education policy? Or are we simply waiting somebody to nurture us to implement this or implement that? So my uh, request to all of you, my appeal to all of you is that we need to take the first step in implementing many of the national education policy which do not require any funding. It only requires attitudinal change. It only requires a cultural change in our institutes. So with those comments, um, I would like to conclude here by quoting what somebody said. You prepare the child for the road. You don't prepare the road for the child. That is our <laughs> responsibility. Thank you. Thank you very much. Present focus on uh, healthcare and economy building. NEP implementation and execution, uh, it may take some time. Your comments, sir. Um, there are some aspects of NEP which can be implemented in a shorter uh, time duration. For example, from the coming academic session, we are working on implementing a common entrance examination uh, in the country. Because today, the admissions are based on various uh, uh, schemes. It could be based on plus two marks. It could be based on locally conducted entrance examination. The students had to write multiple ex uh, entrance examinations. So the National Testing Agency, I'm a member of the board of the NTA, we are planning on implementing a computer-based uh, entrance test across the country. Initially, of course, we will start with the central universities, but it is open for all the state universities also to become part of this entrance examination. And the uniqueness of this entrance examination is that it will have a certain percentage of questions to test the aptitude of the student uh, in the chosen field, and then it will also test the subject domain knowledge of the student, right? So it will be implemented from next year, uh, and. Uh, I, I, I hope that uh, Karnataka State Universities also will become part of this. You know, some universities say that, you know, we are located in a local area. Nearly 60% of our universities are located in rural areas. Only local students apply to this. So why should we go for the national entrance examination? Point one. Point two, some people say that our students are not so well conversant with the computer-based test. Believe me, that uh, the national testing agency will conduct this examination in 14 different languages. And uh, uh, it will make sure that the centers are available uh, in the nearest possible uh, location to the students. And it is also um, making sure that the online test uh, is available to the students so that they can practice beforehand they come for this examination. That is point one. And point two, 
even if you are admitting the local students, uh, uh, students are not coming from the national level, why do you want to have the botheration of conducting a local entrance examination, local test? You can use the ranking that the students have got in this national examination and then appropriately design your admission process and admit them. So this is one thing that is happening. The other one, um, which is a very, very important component in the national education policy, is the academic bank of credits. So um, the, the, the digital content is being aggressively developed and there is also going to be a platform similar to SWAM where students can actually take online courses. 40% uh, of the credits they can actually get from other universities. So many such things are rapidly being implemented because I'm part of some of those committees. I'm aware of the progress that we are making. But as I said during my talk, even without waiting for those things to be implemented within the institutions, we have several things that we can do. For example, I'll just give you ma'am uh, uh, one example. In JNU, we have introduced a five-year BSc, MSc integrated program in Ayurveda biology. We introduced this even before the national education policy was announced. So what stops us from thinking out of the box and coming up with new programs which are in tune with the NEP? That is why I am uh, requesting all my colleagues here that you take the first step and you think what can be done within your institutes and start implementing them. Good morning, I am Dr. Satish Biradar. I am Associate Professor in Veterinary College, Bidar, coming from Bidar. My question is, sir, uh, since last 20 years we are here. And it is well known. Mother language is the best uh, language to learn. But somehow we are not able to go ahead, like when, where I come from, Bidar. It has got some five languages, Kannada, Marathi, Hindi, Urdu, and Telugu also. So English is becoming a uh, medium of instruction. We are not able to share. But sir, sorry. Northeast India, um, we have close to about 160 languages. So if you want to teach in local language, how will you teach? That is one challenge that we have, and I'm sure technology can help if real-time translation can be done, if real-time transliteration can be done, um, many of these problems can be overcome. All that I'm saying is, as engineers and scientists, our job is to find solutions to the challenges, not give up uh, at, when, when we are staring at a, a challenge. I'm sure ultimately solutions will emerge and we should be able to teach our kids in their own mother tongue. That's a possibility in my view. Sir, myself, Unnal Jadav from Karnataka University, Dharwad. Huh. Sir, I have two questions to you, sir. First thing is about uh, drain of brain theory. Uh, most of uh, IITNs who do uh, study in India and they live for uh, abroad. For example, the best example is uh, uh, Parag Agarwal, sir, who done uh, his IIT from Bombay and uh, he is now CEO of uh, uh, Twitter, sir. And my second question is uh, equity of education, sir. Uh, recently, uh, Tamil Nadu government is constantly fighting with center to remove the NEET exam because the data what showing is uh, most of the 85% of quota of our state, uh, most of students coming from uh, uh, urban, urban sir, only 5 to 10% of students coming from a rural area. So what, what should we done to remove these two? Okay, very briefly, uh, for your information, because I'm an IITN, nearly 80% of the IIT graduates, they stay back in India which is a good news. Um, and, and along with the rest of the engineers, they are building our country. So we are very, very proud of them. Um, and the rest of the 15% or so who are going abroad, they are pride of India. Why do you think they are uh, drain brain? We have so much of diaspora across the world today. They are a strong, they are, they are a strong supporting system for our country. So I think this um, thinking of that, you know, people who have gone abroad are a drain uh, to our country is something that we need to relook at. They are also our asset. For example, um, when it comes to international uh, negotiations, um, when it comes to geopolitics, the diaspora which is there in various countries, they are playing a significant role in making sure that India's interests are also addressed.
That is my first question. And the second uh, answer to the first question, the second question about NEET or any other, uh, you know, JEE, for example, it is a fact that uh, the students who come from the rural background, they are extremely talented. There is a, absolutely no doubt about that. I come from a small village. But what is required for us is to provide better access to them, better training to them. And that is why uh, we have now, as part of the national education policy, we are working on a national mentoring scheme, taking the services of the retired professors, retired teachers, and providing training to the students who come from the disadvantaged background, from the rural background. So a lot of efforts are being done. So don't go by uh, the current status, look into future, how we can transform the future. Thank you, sir.